morning. It's time for us to begin our evening study of kingdom family, kingdom marriages. Again, thank you all for being you know, part of this study. I'm going to ask again, if you're not talking, to mute your mics. i let you also know these uh, sessions are being recorded. Also, I'll let you know that there's going to be an opportunity afforded to you to ask any Bible questions you might have uh, or have me explain anything that I may have said that you don't understand, okay? And so please know that those opportunities are always afforded to you during any of our Zoom studies, okay? Uh, again, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to begin there tonight in just a few moments. Uh, before we get started, do want to open up in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Coffee, if you don't mind, you know, to, just to give us that prayer to get us started for tonight, my brother. Let us, <clears throat> let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for another day and for another opportunity, Father, to call upon your name once again. We thank you, Father, for being with us, Father, throughout this day, Father, that we had a ready mind to come together as brethren to hear another portion of your word. We thank you, Father, for your love that towards mankind that you gave your only begotten Son to come into this world to die a death, that we may have a right to the tree of life. We thank you, Father, for your long suffering, Father, that you are patient with us, Father, for those that have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's our desire as much as it is yours, Father, that, that all men are saved. And if there's someone that's present tonight that have not obeyed the gospel, we just pray, Father, that the message that we are here tonight will prick their hearts, um, that they may ask the more important question, what must I do to be saved according to the scripture? We thank you, Father, for your manservant, Father, who has prepared a lesson for us to, to study, to hear, to learn, and to apply to our lives. We thank you, Father, for all that he does for the kingdom. We pray, Father, continues for his family. For his loved ones, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all those that he is uh, impacting in their lives according to your word. We pray for the families that are represented here in all the churches of Christ throughout this world, Father, that we just pray, Father, that things which are said tonight will be pleasing in your sight, rightly divided, and sound doctrine, Father. We ask, Lord, to forgive us, the Lord, of our sins and cleanse us, Father, from all unrighteousness. And we ask these blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Coffey. Uh, we're... In Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to commence reading at verse 1. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get you out of your country, and from your kindred, and from your father's house, unto a land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and curse him that curse you. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's <clears throat> son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan, the Bible says, they came. You know, tonight I want to talk to you and I on the subject of home is where the heart is. Home is where the heart is. You know, I remember growing up, and maybe some of you do too, watching the movie, uh, The Wizard of Oz. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. It was a famous movie uh, way back in the day. But, you know, one of the lines, the famous lines in that movie, if you remember, was, there, there is no place uh, like home. I remember that. You know, I, actually, I think that's really the theme, you know, of the movie, that there is no place uh, like home. It's the key of the movie. Uh, uh, but there was a lot of, you know, lines in the movie that are, are memorable, but I think that is one that's memorable because, you know, in that sense, you know, really there is no place uh, like, like home. And when we're talking about home, we're talking about a place where there is stability, where there is, where there is, where there is relationship, where there is security, and where there is love. And so in that movie, you know, that movie Wizard of Oz, that you think about it, Dorothy, as she was walking there, you know, the idea was when at the end of the movie, they said she wasn't far from home and she just simply clicked her heels, you know, three times. But there were other lines in that movie. You remember one was the, uh, the, uh, the, the witch. I think the old witch Glenda would say, I would get you my pretty, you know, but we don't really remember that line, even though I kind of like that line because that's, kind of how I used to do my daughter. I'm going to get you my little pretty, you know, things like that. But we remember, you know, the line, uh, there's no place uh, like, like, like home. Uh, and so, because it's what we long for. 
You know, we long for stability, we long for security, we long for a place that's called love. You know, this time of year, or well, well, last year, we're not far from the Christmas holidays where every song on the radio was talking about, about home. There's no place like uh, home for the holidays. There's a song that you heard over and over during the, during the holiday season. And then the other one, I'll be home for Christmas. You know, if only in, in, in my dreams. Okay, and so I think most of us on, on here we understand that home is not about a building or a structure; it's about security. And I bring that up because in Genesis 12, uh, when you you look at this account here of Abram before his name even changed to Abraham, what God is telling Abram to do is He's telling him to leave home. You know, look at verse number one again. The Lord had said unto Abram, "Get you out of your country, and from your kindred, and from your father's house, unto a land that I will." show you now remember brothers and sisters abraham is the father of faith that's who he is he's a father of faith he's the guy that god holds up uh, to those of us who obey the gospel and say your life needs to exemplify abraham your faith needs to exemplify your father abraham and abraham's faith was a faith that was willing to be obedient to god even at the sake of leaving what he knew uh, as a place of love and civility and security, okay? At God's command, he did what God told him to do. Now, I want you to go to Hebrews 11. I want you to turn there with me, because there's some things, I think, in Hebrews 11 that we may miss when we talk about Abraham that I want us to see tonight, because, again, God wants those of us who obey the gospel. He does. He wants our faith to be just like his. Hebrews chapter 11, the Hebrew writer talks about the faith of Abraham uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. And I want to commence the reading at verse number 8 of Hebrews chapter 11. In verse number 8, the Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was received of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, promises, but have been seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them uh, a, a city. Now, so I wanted to read those verses because, you know, notice that Abraham had the faith. So to do what God told him to do, when you, when you look at what the Hebrew writer says in verse number 8 about Abraham, notice the Bible says in, this, in the New Testament that Abraham, when he was called to go unto a place. Now, now notice this. The, the, the Old Testament didn't say that he was called to go to a place. But the New Testament uses this word. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out, out into a place which he should have to receive for inheritance. But the Bible actually said back in Genesis 12 that he went to, to see a land. Uh, God had promised him a land, and that's exactly what Abraham eventually is going to go to, a land, a land promise. So something we miss when you look at this is that Abraham wasn't just looking for a land because at the end of the day, he never did inherit himself a land. He never inherited a land. He was always a pilgrim or a sojourner you know so even in the land think about this that abraham actually got to see in canaan he was still a sojourner he was still a pilgrim it was he was never he, he was never there permanently and that's never how he perceived 
the land that he actually got to, to live in, okay? Uh, go back with me, if you would, to Genesis 23. I'm going to show you some Genesis 23, and I'm going to show you all why I think this is important for us to get. While you turn to Genesis 23, this is important for, for us to get. Yeah. Because, saints, we can talk about family relationships. We can talk about how we should treat each other. We should talk about the wife or the husband, the, the, uh, the, 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 the role of the wife and the husband and the children. But if we don't grasp that this world is not our home, uh, that the Bible gives us the words and the instructions to live by, therefore we must believe them, then none of this matters. You and I have got to understand that this world is not our, our ultimate home, that we are looking for a better place. Uh, we are citizens of a different kingdom than this world. And so that must be our, our primary mindset. And so our minds as children of God, if you've obeyed the gospel, our mindset and our faith must be like that of faithful Abraham. Abraham went into Canaan's land. But Abraham never lived in Canaan's land as though he was there permanently. Make sure you get that. He never acted as though he was going to be there permanently. So when you get to Genesis 23, I want you to see this here. Abram and Sarah get to Canaan's land. They're there. But Sarah dies. And so when you look in Genesis chapter 23, notice what happens here when Sarah dies. In Genesis 23 and verse, verse number 1. Sarah was 107 and 27 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kerjath Arba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So notice, the promised land is Canaan. This is where they are, okay? Abraham and Sarah are in Canaan's land, the land that God had promised to the children of Israel. Now look in verse 3. And Abraham stood up from before his dead. And spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury your dead. None of us shall withhold from you his sepulchre but that thou mayest bury thy dead. Now, I want you to see what's going on here. Although Abraham, if Abram is in the land that God has promised, he still views his position here in this world. He still sees himself as a stranger and a sojourner. Understand this. Abraham still at this point owns none of the land. He owns none of it. As rich as he is, as wealthy as he is, his wife dies while they're in Canaan land, but yet he owns nothing. And so he's requesting from them to buy a piece of parcel from them. Now you read this in your own leisure, but they're gonna, they understand how great and how powerful uh, Abraham is, how wealthy he is. They want to give him land, but Abraham refuses to be given the land. He's going to make sure that he purchases it. Now why do I bring this up? Well, but is there something on the outside? You and I <laughs> To have that same mentality that Abraham has as it comes to our walk here on this earth. And that is to understand, brothers and sisters, that this world is not our home. What Abraham understood is what you and I got to understand, the big picture. And the big picture is our real home is in heaven. That's where our heart ought to be. And so you and I, when it comes to family here on this earth, life here on this earth, relationships here on this earth, it must must be based upon our citizenship in heaven. Just like Abraham, we are sojourners. We're just passing through this land. And so how we treat one another, how we live here, it reflects where our citizenship and where it comes from, and that's heaven. So what do I want us to learn? Well, how do we have this faith of Abraham when it comes to our relationships? Three things I want to give you tonight. Three things. First thing, we must believe without seeing. We must believe without seeing. None of us on here have seen Jesus. None of us on here has seen heaven, but we read God's word. We know God's word is true. And so what we must do is we must yield to the word of God when it comes to how we are to conduct ourselves on this side of heaven. we got to believe God's word and not the culture. See, too many of us, when it comes to our family, we're letting culture dictate how we should run our homes, how we should live our lives. That's not how we operate. We must yield to the will of God. And we must trust that the God that we serve, he's capable, he's credible, 
book, and he knows what's best. See, our world and society has a problem with submission in God's divine order. Go to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. Brothers and sisters, this is not going to change. And when you and I try to change God's divine order of the home, uh, God's divine plan of the structure of the home, you've opened the door or you just left it unlocked for Satan to open it himself and come right on your home. This will not change. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, Paul writes, inspired by the Spirit, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. You see that? That doesn't change, hey, brothers and sisters. And so what we need to do, if you're a parent, you need to be teaching this to your children. If you're a parent, you need to let your children know this. This is God's divine order for the home. And I'll say this to every parent on here, and every husband, every wife on here, you need to fight for your family. You cannot be fearful of the culture and what people are going to say about you for being uh, honorable to God's will in your life. You have got to stand up and fight and speak up for what's right in your family. You cannot be fearful. If you're a member of the church, understand this. You do not have a spirit of fear. You have a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Remember back in Nehemiah's day? Go to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah, when they were when they came back from, from the... Uh, exile and they were to be building the walls of the temple well with building and doing god's work there's always going to be opposition brothers and sisters i want you to make sure you understand that being in the church if you obey the gospel it's not a cruise ship you're not cruising in the heaven but this is not a cruise ship this is not the carnival we are on a battleship we are fighting while we're here but we fight with the word of god and with the fight there's always going to come opposition this world is going to oppose what you and I teach and believe, especially when it comes to the Word of God. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 4, this it was no different from them in the flesh, in the physical, while they were building the walls. In Nehemiah 4, verse 14, I'll start with 13 to keep the context, because I want you to notice here what Nehemiah says in Nehemiah 4, verse 13. Therefore said I, this is what Nehemiah said he did, I set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people after their families, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people. And here's what I'm saying to you and I tonight. Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses okay and so this is the information that nehemiah gives them after they're filled with fear because of the opposition while they're trying to do god's work so number one we got to believe without seeing number two we must see the big picture like abraham did say we got to see the big picture and that picture is this world is not our home this world is not our home we can we, we not, need not to be living like we're going to be here forever this world is not our home. And so therefore, when in Rome, we can't do what the Romans do. If what the Romans are doing is contradicting God's word. In Romans chapter 12, this is written to Christians. Romans chapter 12. And again, while you turn now, the reason we got to go over this, brothers and sisters, because I don't want these lessons just to be hoorah speeches. That motivates you, make you feel good for the moment and yet you you leave these zoom studies or you leave your bible class study and you make no changes in your life so get on here and uh, and absorb all this information and do nothing with it means nothing to god i'm gonna tell you, it doesn't change your life and, and it doesn't help your soul salvation so when you and i look into the mirror of god's word and you know there are some things that you're not doing in your family in your walk in your relationship you need to make the changes in your life i need to make the changes in my life it's not just being a hearer of the word and do something. In Romans chapter 12, and that's not going to happen unless you change your mind. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Okay? And so I wanted to uh, make sure we get that. You and I have got to see the big picture. This world is not our home. In Colossians chapter 3, in verse number 1, 
Colossians 3 and verse 1, Paul again writing to Christians, he tells us where our affections ought to be. In Colossians 3 and verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections, where? On things above, and not on the things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, now see, that's the key. Is Christ your life? Who is our life shall appear. Then shall you also appear with him in, in glory, okay? And so what Abraham did, brothers and sisters, is he believed in a place. Make sure you get that. The Hebrew writer lets us know Abraham was looking far beyond the land that he inherited. He was looking for a place. And if you're a Christian, understand this, we are looking for a place. Remember, the Bible is very clear in John chapter 14. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you may be also. Now, there can be times in this Christian walk and in this life you can become discouraged, saints. Don't get me wrong. I'm not on here saying deny the reality. But what I am saying, when you and I recognize we, ha we haven't been the family that we ought to be, uh, the member in the family we ought to be, we need to look up. That's what we need to do. When you've fallen short, you need to look up and trust God's promises. You know, we looked at Genesis chapter 12. I want you to go back to Genesis 15. Give me a five, five more minutes, and then I'm going to open this thing up. Go to Genesis chapter 15. You remember, this didn't happen immediately. When God makes his promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, it didn't happen immediately. Some time went by, and if, you, if you're a student of the Bible, you know that there were times that Abraham and Sarah's uh, faith actually faltered. But look at me in Genesis chapter 15. While you turn there, let me just remind you, when God, God makes that promise to Abraham that, you know, he was going to give him a land and he was going to make of him a, a great nation, Abraham has no children at that time. There's not, he has not one son at that time when God says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I mean, he's saying this to a man who has no children and a wife who's never had a child and has been bigger. He's 75 years old when God makes that, 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 that promise to him. And so, when you get to Genesis chapter 15, look with me in verse number 1. You know, after a while, you know, you get to thinking and wondering, God, what are you going to do what you said you're going to do? And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. Genesis 15, verse 1. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, and this listen what God tells him. This shall not be your heir. But he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Now look what God gets him to do. Look up. Look up, Abraham. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if you be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall your seed be. So the idea, brothers, is when you get weary and, and, and it doesn't look like things are happening going your way, you need to look up. Remember, and you look up by remembering God keeps his promises, okay? God keeps his promises. Finally, 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 we got to consciously state that we are sojourners, okay? We, when we look at Abraham, he consciously stated that I'm a sojourner. He let these people know in Canaan land, this is not my home. And saints, that's what you and I have got to be. When you have your worldly girlfriend tell you, girl, if I was you, and whatever they're going to say, whatever I was you, if it ain't no book, chapter, and verse, you need to dismiss it. Girl, I wouldn't be listening to that. And I'm going to tell you, the same girl that's doing that as soon as you divorce him, she all in him face. Just make sure you understand that. And so you need to get rid of work. And two, let man, man, you gotta run your house, man. I'm gonna run my house. But she ain't gonna tell me nothing to nothing. She say, yeah, okay. I'm gonna find yourself by yourself alone, fooling, and lose a good thing listening to foolish counsel. And it's a sad that we have saints that's doing that, listening to foolish counseling. You need to let the world know I'm gonna do what God says to do. The Bible says be submissive. My husband loves me. He's not telling me to do anything that goes against God's word. Yeah, amen. I'm going to cook dinner for him. Amen. I am because it's what God told me to do. Husband, yeah, I got a good wife. She's doing what God would have her to do. She's treating me right. She ain't running the streets. Amen. I'm taking her out. Bye. See y'all later. We're going on a date. Not with y'all tonight. That's what you need to be able to do. 
That's what you got to do. This world is not our home. Okay? You got to understand this, brothers and sisters. You and I can't have a mentality where we want to join the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. They can join us, but we can never join them. And that's that's Abraham's mentality. I'm going to buy this land because this is not my inheritance. I am not for here, and you can't give me nothing. I will pay for it, okay? And so even though God will eventually cleanse that land, let me tell you something. It was never their permanent residence, okay? We are not from here. And you and I have got to understand that. So don't let the world fool you as I close. Do not let the world fool you. Don't let the world fool you, saints. Home is where your heart is. And our heart should be in heaven because we understand that's where our home is. And unless God, and I'll close with this, Psalms 127, and I think the psalmist got this right. And I'll close with Psalms 127. And then I want to, after I do this, I'll open it up, and then I want to clear up something that I said last week. Or I just want to qualify something I said last week during our last Tuesday study. Now, here's the remedy. Here we go. What we have to understand, Psalms 127, and I'm done with this subject. Psalms 127 and verse 1. The psalmist says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord will keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that had his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Saints, home is where the heart is. Let's stay strong. Let's rep represent. We represent Christ and the church. And so let's make sure our relationships are godly relationships. I'm going to open it up for any questions or comments at this time. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? Thank you for the 30 minutes y'all have given me thus far. Any questions? Um, yes. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so without getting into, like, too much detail... Like, I'm in a situation where um, my husband wants to, like, file for divorce, and I don't think he has just yet. Um, and so I'm really trying, I understand what I could have done better in our marriage, and I'm trying to, like, fight to, like, stay together so we can fix it. But, so this is kind of like a two-part question. Yes, ma'am. Um, the first question is kind of like, not that, I understand that there's literally nothing that I can do. So it's like, is it wrong that I'm like preparing for the worst, but like um, hoping for the best because reconciliation has to be too. And then also um, when it comes to like, I guess home. So basically um, we live in an apartment together. And so he's really pushing me to break the lease, but I don't want to break the lease because I'm trying to like fight to like save it. And I just feel like, if I were to leave the home, that makes it even um, greater of a chance, or like it kind of leaves the door to like reconciliation smaller. Um, so I just don't know really what to do. Cause it's like, okay, well, do I just break the lease and trust God that like in due time? Cause I don't know how long it might take, you know? Yes, or it's like, do I just stay and Still hope for great, stuff. Great question. And, and let me say this, Ms. Alexandria. Thank you, uh, first and foremost, for being open and uh, and acknowledging that you, you need some godly counsel in your area. Uh, I don't know if you're a Christian or not. Are you a member? And I, I'm gonna, what, are you a member of the Lord's Church by chance, Church of Christ, or no? Yeah, I am, you and are? we both okay. are. Um, and that's the thing. My okay, husband great. Hasn't okay. Been getting so let me help you with this. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I'm gonna. I want you, to, and, and I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna say this. When I told y'all I had some things I wanted to clear up, I said next week, this is exactly what it was. I didn't know her dilemma. I did not. I don't, this is her first time she's sharing this with me. But this is what I wanted to clear up from last week. And I'm going to tell you, let me tell you what I was going to do. You know, we talk about, brothers and sisters, our role and our responsibility. And that's rightly so. We ought to do that. I have a responsibility. My wife has a responsibility. Your husband, wife, you may have a responsibility. But brothers and sisters, we live in a world of sin. The reality is everybody's not going to do right. The reality is it's not one saved, always saved. You can marry a Christian guy, Christian girl, and it doesn't mean they're going to always be faithful to the things of God. It doesn't mean they're always going to be a believer. And so I wanted to, I, and that's exactly what I was going to talk about tonight, 
how does a person deal and handle situations where one of the parties is not doing right? Does God want me to stay in a verbal, a physical, abusive relationship? Does he expect me to do that? Now, let's get God's answer, not Brother Henry's. First Corinthians chapter 7 gives the answer. And I thank you again, uh, Sister Alexandria, for this. Uh, because it's needed, and I'm telling you, God is right on time. I know he is. His spirit is, is, is there and, and very much a part of this study, because I promise you this is exactly where I was going to go tonight. Now, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, what Paul does here is he's giving instructions um, to married people, uh, divorced people, uh, widows, people who've lost their spouse. He gives instruction because, again, we are in a world of sin. Yes, from the beginning, it wasn't God's desire that people divorce. But his, that, that desire for God was before sin entered into the world. When he put Adam and Eve together, there was no sin in the world as far as from man. Okay? And so now, people uh, are, are people. We live in a world of sin. So in verse number, I'll start with verse 8. Verse, verse 27, 8. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows... It's good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Okay? So that is God's desire. Stay married if you can stay married. You know, stay together if you can stay together. But, look at verse 11. And if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled. Consigned her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So that's the idea. You all want to stay married. You're a Christian. You do your part. Now look at verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother have a wife that believe it not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And if the woman which hath a husband that believe it not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So you have a person who's now become a Christian, married to an unchristian. Don't leave the person because they're not a Christian. Okay. Now, verse number 13, uh, 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, here you go, so so awful. if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God had called us to peace. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to read some other verse. But now, now, notice this. Yes, you want your marriage to work. I think everybody should get married. Yes, uh, you, you, you understand we have a ministry of reconciliation. You're doing your part. You're, you're doing what you can to, to try to make the marriage work, get the count. But he or she, whatever, don't, they don't want to leave. The, the other party does not, uh, don't want to stay, rather. Forgive me. They want to leave. Um, they're not happy. You've done all you can do. This is where you just have to just trust God to give you the strength, my sister. I mean, that's all I can say. You can't, as you already said, you can't make people love you. And you don't want to be, you don't want people who will stay with you, you know, just for the sake of worrying about what everybody else may say or think. You want to be in a relationship where the love, my sister, that you give is reciprocated. You know, you don't want anybody just doing things out of just doing it. And so... And, and I want everyone on there saying you don't and God don't expect you to stay in a relationship where you're being physically, verbally, uh, mentally, emotionally abused by your mate. And that works both ways because there are some women that can do the same thing to men. So I want to make sure we understand that those type of abuses can happen from either spouse. And so if this individual wants to leave uh, my sister, you really have to let him go. See, we have a lot of people who've been taught they'll just hang in there, even with the physical and the, and, the, and the verbal abuse. Hang in there, keep taking the beatings, keep taking the abuse, keep doing what you're supposed to do. But I'm going to tell you, the scripture doesn't teach it. I see hands going up. The scripture doesn't teach that. See, because you don't know if you will save this individual by staying in those relationships. This is exactly what Paul is saying in verse number 16. In 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 16, this is what he says. So notice in verse 15, he said, they want to go, let them go. You're called to live in peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether you shall save your husband, or knowest thou, O man, whether you shall save your wife? So by staying or begging him to say, love you, my sister, you know, you don't know if you'll save him. 
And so you pray, you do your part, but at the end of the day, you have to love God more than you love anybody. And so I hope that information kind of helped you there just a little bit, sister. Now, as far as the counseling on, on what you should do, remember now, you're talking about the apartment. Remember, the apartment is not the house anyway. I mean, it's just a house, not the home. As I was trying to mention tonight, home is about the relationship. You know, you could be staying in your parents' home, a uh, house, and you and your husband be there, and it'd be a home. You see what I'm saying? It'd be a home while you're working on getting your own place to live in. And so what I'm saying is just understand it's just a play. If you can afford it, uh, being single, then, then keep it. It'll, it'll help your credit. But if you can't, sister, uh, just know that, you know, it's just material. And uh, what you lose physically, you can regain. I want to make sure you understand that. You can regain that. And if you're doing all that you're supposed to do, just trust me. You have to look at yourself as this, as precious, as gold. And it, it's his loss at the end of the day. And believe me, if you're with God and you're doing what God's will is, you have nothing to regret at the end of the day. The shame will be on him and it will be his loss at the end of the day. And God knows if you can't contain uh, or you have this desire to be with someone else, I'm going to tell you this. God will allow you to find another spouse to give your heart and your love to. Okay? And so this is what your faith has to kick in, Sister Alexandra. And I hope that just helps. And maybe, you know, we can talk later on down the line and, and, and do some counseling as well. But I hope that just helped you out a little bit and give you some courage to hang in there and don't give up on God. Uh, Brother Coffee and Brother Green. Um, great counsel, my brother, and great message tonight. Um, I'm pretty big on James uh, 5 and 16. And it just, and it appears to me, you know, um, listen to the sister's heart. Um, this is uh, what I want to believe that she's already done. Um, confess our faults one to another and pray for one another that they may be healed. The effectual fervent prayers of the righteous man prevaileth much. And so I, I want to start this conversation. I mean, start the thought, but then I want you to finish it because it's something that um, that I heard you speak on in chapter seven, because when you have in the lesson, when you mentioned fighting, when you mentioned fight, um, and it appears, you know, that the sister wants the marriage to work, but it's, you know, so when you have a spouse who just want to go through that to, 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 to dissolve the marriage, what what, I, what I'm saying is, is that we don't know his heart, but at, at the same time, too, could it be a situation where he wants to get out because there's something down the street that he's looking at? And, and so and, and, and again, you know, that God is going to deal with him on, on, on that part because you want to do all that you can. But when you I don't know how I don't know the details. We don't need to. But I, 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 I don't know. It's just, it's just unfortunate. But. You know, is he still going to church? Is he still praying? Is he still doing the things that he will, that we're all commanded to do? And so that, that's my comment, but I, I don't want to be babbling too long, but it's just sad and unfortunate. It's my comment. It is. And God hates divorce, but you know, that's just that's where we are. You know, uh, I don't know his heart either, but you know, we know God, God does. And, but again, you, you are not want to be with anybody who don't love you. I just, that's just the end of the day. You fought, you've done all, as much as lied in you, you live at peace with all men. Uh, but after that, if they want to go, just trust me, uh, God will fill that void. Uh, and that's the problem with people putting another person in their heart where God belongs. And brothers and sisters, don't ever do that. There's no person, place, or thing, not even your children, not, you know, you love. Don't put anything in your heart where God belongs. And if you put God where he belongs in your heart, believe me, he'll help you deal with everything under that. Okay, and that's the only thing I can I can say to you. Use it, my sister, as a development uh, tool to grow your faith and just trust God that he will supply all your needs. Uh, Brother Green. Yes, um, I just want to commend the sister also for her honesty and her openness. And I want to go to the same scripture where you had just said, uh, Brother Steve said, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I want to read verse number 3. Uh, which says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. 
So my comment is that if there's no due benevolence on one part or the other of both, then that's when what you were saying in the later verses in this chapter kicks in. If that person wants to go, go, you know, let them go. Because, you know, there should be that due benevolence one towards another. And if, if that's not being received, then, of course, there's going to be problems. And, you know, you have to do what you have to do. That was the first thing I wanted to say. Second of all, I wanted to um, go to Luke chapter 14. And I just want the sister to keep this in mind as well. What Jesus said in Luke 14 and um, what's the verse I'm looking for in 26. It says, if any man come to me and hate not his father or mother or and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple, which goes back to what Brother Stevenson was saying about loving Christ more. Because in that verse when it says hate, that means to love less. Not that you hate them, but you love them less than you love Christ. So you have to love him more and keep him first. And I'll give you this encouragement as well, sister. You know, if you do that with Christ, then everything else, like it tells us in the scripture, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. So, I mean... Like the brethren was saying, you know, you do your part and do what you can do. And that's all any of us can do. And once it's gotten to that point to where you've done all you can, then you look to the Lord, you know, for your guidance and, and what's best to do. And I just want to say it again, you know, I do commend you and will definitely be praying for you, sister, because, you know, I just hope that whatever happens, you know, it be the Lord's will and it be the best possible thing. Amen. Yeah, thank you, brother. And uh, sister, I'm not saying don't deny, you know, the, the pain, you know, you, you didn't, you don't, I mean, it, it's real, you know, and you hurt and, and, and you know, you're going to hurt. Uh, keep fighting, do what you can, get some counseling, and then and after that, we'll just put it in God's hand. Anybody have anything else? Hope that helped, my sister. Yeah, hope that helps. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Any? Uh, thank you, my sister. God bless you. Uh, anybody have any other questions, comments, or thoughts? Even if it doesn't pertain to what we talked about tonight. Any other questions? Any comments? Any thoughts that help us out tonight? All right, saints. Well, thank you all so much for being a part of this study tonight. Remember, our next study will be on Brother Green Zoom page a uh, little thursday night we're in zephaniah chapter five zephaniah chapter five that'll be on brother green's zoom page okay uh if you don't uh have brother call uh, brother call didn't have your information your email you can go ahead and put it in the chat section if you're interested in any of the recordings uh brother coffee can send those to you to so that you can listen to them later on and so i'll, I'll give a few minutes for those who don't uh, have their information to give the brother coffee as of yet you can give it to him now in the chat section and he'll, or he can put his in there. Brother Coffee, how about, that'll probably be easier. Can you go ahead and put your information, Brother Coffee, in there so they can have yours and they can, they can send that to you so you don't have to write all theirs now? Okay, he's going to put that in the chat section. And Saints, while he's doing that, again, I just want to make sure that, you know, I as well as you all, you know, during these studies that we, find something that we can apply to our lives and we implement it, okay? It does us no good to retain this information, to know it, and then don't apply it to our lives. Remember, we have the ministry of reconciliation. You know, those of us on here are Christians. You know, we've been reconciled, and we don't know how to get along and settle disagreements. Well, you know, how are we going to help the world? And so let's just make sure we watch how we walk and redeem the time because the days are, in fact, evil. Brother Coffee, have you put that in the information yet? I don't see it. It's there. Does anybody, does everybody else have it except me? It should does anybody be. see brother, anybody over here see Brother Coffee's message in the chat? No. No, sir. I don't know why I, I have it on my side. Give me. Yeah, I'll give you a few minutes. Uh, brother Stevenson, while we're waiting uh, for Brother Coffee to enter his information, uh, just uh, want a, re a reminder to keep uh, Brother Javier's family in prayer. 
with the death that they just suffered in their family. Um, his, his, his cousin died and the family's flying in from Mexico. And also, I just want to ask you uh, to keep my family lifted up in prayer too. You know, we have the situation going. I explained everything to you all about my sister-in-law. And now we're having a struggle with guardianship. And we're trying to get her where she can come and live with us and not have to go back to that nursing home because it's a terrible place. So I just want to ask you all to keep our family lifted up in prayer as well that we're successful in that. Do you see it now? Do you see it in the chat? Yeah, we can't see it. Okay, no, we can't see it. It's, uh, spell it out for him, brother, brother Henry. Okay, good. I'll type it in. What is it? C O F F E Y. Pest control. At gmail. Okay. Dot com. Okay, I'll put it in here. I'm Anybody not, needs it? Um, it says direct. I'm not sure why that is. Okay, I just put it in there. Make sure, is that right, Brother Coffee? Yes. Correct. Okay, so that's his email. If you're interested in any of the uh, past recordings or this recording, just uh, email Brother Coffee and he'll send that on to you. Are there any other prayer requests before we close out tonight? Any prayer requests, Saints? Okay. Yes, Brother. <clears throat> Okay, hey amen. Why is asking for prayer for faith or keep the faith and to stay strong and for the Bible studies? Anybody else? Uh, yes, I uh, also keep my family in prayer as well, Brother Henry. And also, I, had a, I found out one of my cousins passed away uh, Sunday morning. Uh, so definitely keep my, my family in prayer as well, uh, the Anderson family. Yeah, sure will, my brother. Sure will. Anybody, Brother Green? Okay, Brother Green, you have your hand up? Yes, sir. Um, I forgot. I also keep my daughter, Samantha, lifted up in prayer. Uh, she was diagnosed with COVID. So I also want to keep her lifted up in prayer for a speedy recovery. Okay. Okay. Brother Crosby's asking for prayer. I see that in the chat. Don't defeat the devil and oppositions. Okay. And so, so we're going to keep you in prayer. My sister definitely will uh, be praying uh, for you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Good to see the Williams on. I see Brother Mike and Sister Lydia. We definitely keep little Mikhail Williams in, in our prayers. Uh, thank God for them. Anybody else? Okay, if not, saints, let's bow with our Father in prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, we approach your throne of grace and mercy tonight. In the name that's above every name, Jesus. Thanking you, Father, again for another opportunity of life. As we slumbered and slept on last night, things were going on around us that we were not privy to. Dear God, you woke us up and we're here, not because of our own goodness, but Father, because of your grace and your mercy. And we are just so grateful for it, Father. And I pray to Father every day that you allow us to live, uh, Father, as we have been life, that Father, we have a mindset to put you first. Pray that we who've named the name of Jesus on this Zoom call understand this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our responsibility is to seek the kingdom and its righteousness and understand that everything else will be added unto us. Us. Dear God, be with our brother Javier, uh, who's had family members who've passed away. Dear God, just give that brother strength, and Father, give his family strength and give him wisdom to deal with this tough time. Be with our brother Green and with his sister-in-law, dear God, and, uh, and his family as well, and everything that they have to deal with, Father, concerning her. And Father, we know you've done uh, great things in this family in the past, and we know that you can do it as well in the future. Be with our brother Kurt. Thank you for his great example. Father, great husband. Uh, Father God, to his wife, who's sick from time to time, and Father, just be with her as well, Father, and we'll continue to lift them up to your throne. Thank you for their faithfulness, dear God, in the kingdom of God, and thank you for Brother Kurtz's his example that he's shown to us over the many uh, years, and uh, Father, we've got to know him via this Zoom study. And Father, they've had death as well in the family, dear God, we just pray that you be with that, that family, the Anderson family, during their time of bereavement, just like Father, we're praying you be with the Javier family during their time of bereavement. Father, be my wife who's asking prayer to be a better Christian, strength, uh, strong in the faith. And Father, her efforts to evangelize this year, Father, to save souls, to reach the lost. Understanding he who so saved his souls, uh, who are soul winners, Father God. Uh, Father, you find favor with them, dear God. So just continue to bless our heart and our efforts, Father, to live right, do right, and speak the oracles of God without fear, dear right. His father and our brother Crosby, dear God, who's dealing with opposition in his home and in his life, dear God, you know what he's dealing with. Father, we just pray that you give him wisdom, strength, and Father, he will not allow the opposition to deter his faith, that he will stand firm, flat footed in the things of God, he will not give up, and always know that you'll never leave him or forsake him. And Father, for our sister Ofer, thank you, Father, for her spirit tonight. Father, you know everything about this, this soul, dear God, and what she's dealing with. She's a daughter of Sarah, 
And so, Father, I just thank you for her courage tonight. And, Father, whether she realizes it or not, tonight she's helped many uh, by her example. To understand, dear Father, that she wants wisdom, and not just any wisdom, she wants godly wisdom. And, Father, she wants wisdom to make the right decisions concerning her home. Father, she's made a vow, not just before men, but she made a vow before you. And, Father, she's concerned about that. And so, Father, I just pray that the information, the words that she got tonight were, were one, not from man, but from God. And, Father, I pray that this sister will find comfort and strength and wisdom, Father, as she tries to continue to fight to do all that she can to make this marriage work. We pray for her husband, Father. I pray that his eyes will be open, Father, whatever the situation may be, to understand and to see, dear God, that he has a, a, a wife who loves him and, Father, who's willing to make it work in the fight despite the obstacles that they're facing. Pray to Father that if there's any sin that's preventing him from doing the right thing in your eyesight. And Father, that he'll remove it from his heart. That he'll understand, dear God, that, that you hate divorce. And that Father, that you don't take it lightly, the vows that we make. And Father, I just pray that if it is sin in his life, that Father, you will not let him be successful. That Father, that because you love him and that you will discipline him. And that he'll come to his senses before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Be with all the families here, Father, on this Zoom study. We all have things I'm sure we can work on and be better in. Help us to make the application to our lives, to God, that it brings glory and honor to your holy and divine name. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest will abide with every child of God on this own call. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, saints. And y'all have a good night. Amen. Love y'all. Stay strong. Love, love you. God bless. Love you all.